Hello and uh, welcome to Sam's Fans Live on Facebook and YouTube. If you're watching, let us know in the comments by saying hi. We would love to know who is watching and if you don't comment, we don't really know. So just say hi, uh, where are you watching from and so on. Today, I'm very excited to continue with our series, The Power of Stories. This is a series of live streamed interviews in which I am chatting with the therapists from the partner institutions that Sam's Friends supports. Particularly, we are talking about their stories and the stories that have influenced and impacted them both in their clinical work and outside of it. And joining me today are Christine Bomberger and Jackie Collins from Cleveland Clinic Children's. Christine is a board certified music therapist she joined Cleveland Clinic Arts and Medicine Institute in 2014 and provides music therapy sessions to inpatient units at Cleveland Clinic Children's. A Virginia native, Christine received her Bachelor's of Music Therapy from Shenandoah Conservatory. She is committed to supporting pediatric patients by providing opportunities for control and improved coping during their hospitalizations. Jackie is an art therapist and licensed professional counselor. She joins Cleveland Clinic Arts and Medicine Institute in 2016 and provide, provides outpatient art therapy services to patients in the pediatric hematology oncology clinic at Cleveland Clinic Children's. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology with a minor in fine arts from Cleveland State University and her master's degrees in art therapy and counseling from Ursuline College in 2016. Jackie specializes in plaster hand casting, which we have a, po a blog post about with patients and their family members. So I'm just gonna bring them into the show here in a second. Hello, Jackie and Christine. Hi, Hi. Sam, great to see you. Great to see you, how are you? Doing great. Thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. And uh, we have Debbie Bates watching hey there. this year. And we have Emily Irvin also saying hi. Great. Hi, everyone. Let us know hi, everyone. if you can hear us through our masks. I can hear you fine. So uh, I hope that our audience can as well. So this is your second time with me on Facebook Live. We had, a, uh, we had a chat maybe two, two years ago, three years ago. I don't even remember. And yeah, that was great. It was great to get to know you and to hear about your work at Cleveland Clinic Children's. Um, so that's also for anybody watching. You can check that out in our videos where we talked about. Um, I don't remember much about what we talked about, but I think it was like getting to know each other, right? And your work at Cleveland right, Clinic. Right. And hopefully yeah. we, can, we can provide something new and exciting today. Absolutely. So uh, before we start, uh, how do things look over at Cleveland Clinic Children's with, you know, within the past year and all the changes that I'm sure you've had? Yeah, it's definitely been an, an interesting year. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to speak to what outpatient's been looking like lately. Sure. So when the pandemic first kind of started, there was a lot of unknown. And, um, you know, it seemed at that time that the biggest concern was safety and, um, you know, the direct person to person contact. So there was a period in time in which we weren't at the hospital but we were able to provide like art kits to the patients who were still coming for their infusions because regardless of the pandemic, other diagnoses like cancer don't stop. So we were able to kind of still provide services from a distance. And we also were able to start um, like figuring out how to do virtual visits with patients, which really opened our profession up to be able to provide patients like a whole new approach to therapy that we didn't have before. Um, I also was filming videos like how-to videos so that patients and families and caregivers could do art at home um, since no one was really leaving the house and you know there was a 
closure on like lots of places where you couldn't go to. So uh, we kind of got creative with things that we just had around the house and were able to prov provide some therapeutic interventions to do as families. So um, about after about like two months, we were able to come back in person at the clinic and we had like certain office days a week. So we kind of rotated who came into the office to still, you know, socially distance ourselves from each other and do it in a safe way and still provide patients kits. Um, after that, we've kind of gone back to normal functioning. Um, we've been able to see our patients again to like full capacity. We obviously don't see patients on precautions who are potentially getting tested for COVID. So we don't see them, but um, we still are able now to see our patients to the capacity in which we were doing before the pandemic, which has been great to get back here and yeah. again and see all of our patients because we miss them for sure. And I'm sure, you know, our services were missed as well because some of our patients look forward to our services the most when they come. Um, so it's been nice to kind of get back into like our normal routine again. And uh, yeah. off what Jackie said, you can, I think that your videos, your Facebook live for the art interventions are still on oh, yeah, the are. clinic children's Facebook. So if anybody wants to go look at those, they're still there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, same, same for me really um, inpatient wise, um, same kind of process, but you know, we, we do have some additional like infection prevention um, measures, you know, specific instruments we can, we cannot bring in. Um, so it's a little different, but as normal as I think that it can be now. So I'm really grateful. For yeah. That. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you are back and that you're um, offering these services at the bedside or like that you're interacting. And I'm sure that there was a lot of resilience and a lot of creativity in going through these months and um, thinking about how to adapt and how to pivot and um, in offering, you know, um, your abilities and what you have to offer to your, to the patients uh, that uh, come through Cleveland Clinic Children's. So, um, great. So as you know, uh, we this is a series called The Power of Stories, where we've been talking about uh, well, stories. And what's been really great has been that some of the guests came up with either a fictional story or with stories from their clinical work and hearing through, uh, hearing about that process and uh, about how patients maybe experience either music therapy or art therapy. It has been a really engaging way of talking about music and art therapy. So I think at this point, maybe we could transition to that. So, because now there's Christine and Jackie, so there are two guests. So we have two stories for our audience today. And we're gonna share one story first and then we'll talk a little bit and then share another story and then we'll talk a little bit about it. So um, I forget who was starting. I think that would be me. <laughs> Great. So um, I th think I'm just gonna stay here on the live stream and then um, feel free to start and share the story. Is this something that you came up with as a fictional story or is this a patient from your, from um, your clinic it, work? It, it incorporates um, some aspects of a specific patient along with some aspects of general interventions, um, but it speaks specifically to one particular um, interaction I did have with a real patient, but I am gonna keep it rather broad, um, keep it broad for time's sake and then also for to protect their privacy. So that's kind Absolutely. of what my story kind of goes with. So, um, you know, one of the coolest parts of our jobs is that we get to see patients in often a completely different light than the medical team. You know, with us, they're often, not always, but often jovial, active, open. And, you know, that comes uh, along with the rapport that we build but also the medium in which we bring to the table, which is, you know, music. It's uh, something normal, something fun, something safe. Uh, but, you know, the medical team doesn't really get to experience or see that. So that's sort of the for focus of my story today, just speaking to the role that music therapy um, can play in fully understanding the child 
and supporting them in every aspect, whether physically, emotionally, cognitively, so on and so forth. Um, so this patient that I'm sort of speaking about broadly was admitted for quite some time. They were awaiting a solid organ transplant. And this patient and I worked through many ups and downs of their treatment from singing steps to addressing change along to the tune of Baby Shark, which if anybody wants a demonstration, I'm happy to show you at a later time. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but we also kind of forced a physician uh, that they were quite scared of to sing a silly song about their cat prior to morning rounds, just to kind of decrease the anxiety of, um, of the child um, when the medical team was there. And obviously this was a younger child, if you couldn't tell, but uh, like many young children, um, they, this child learned, expressed, emoted, learned through play. So, um, you know, during our sessions, we did a ton of improvisations. We made up songs, we used instruments in creative ways. Uh, for example, I remember we used a xylophone as like an OR bed for one of their dolls. So that was that was quite unique. Um, or we we also used um, a boom whacker tube. I don't know if our audience are familiar with boom whackers, but um, they're quite popular. Um, they're just kind of a long tube that has you know if you hit it against something, it's a note. But we looked through it. We played I Spy when they moved to their. Um, ICU room just to kind of help orient and um, familiarize themselves with that room. Um, but one day actually in particular, and this is a day that I just, I'll never forget, um, that they started making up songs about, um, you know, their dolls passing away, their, their doctors passing away. Um, and, you know, they, they would ask like, oh, is this person gonna come back? Or, you know, they kept asking questions and creating these scenarios. And I, I really thought to myself, you know, this is an interaction that I, that I can't ignore. I really have to follow this child's lead. So, you know, within these songs that she was making up and within these scenarios, I would sing, I would sing their, you know, um, their words back frame it as a, as, as a statement. And then I would ask follow-up questions within the song, questions like, well, what do you think is going to happen? Um, you know, how do we remember somebody when they pass away? But most importantly, how do we make sure that all your other dolls, how do we make sure that, that we feel safe? And they would sing or talk their answers back in almost a, a matter of fact kind of, obvious way and I would sing them back or repeat it and um, you know eventually they just kind of changed the subject and happily moved on to something else and you know in that moment I said okay well I guess all of their questions are answered in this moment so you know that's that's kind of a heavy topic but I think those questions are very normal um, and I think in the hospital setting um, you know, it can it can come up a lot. So I, I was really honored that this child trusted me in that moment to explore those questions and those topics. Um, but ultimately, the story does have a happy ending. They did receive their transplant. They are thriving. And, um, you know, I have no idea if they remember our songs that day, but I know that I will not forget that. So that was um, a really powerful um, uh, moment for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, very interesting. And it's almost like um, stories, it's a story about how stories can have a, a place and a very interesting role in therapy, right? And I think that songwriting, um, mm -hmm. it's related a lot to songwriting. So what do you think What's your personal take as far as how this child was thinking about these stories related to the dolls and the 
directions he was taking, do you think he was reflecting the fears that that this child had um, regarding their diagnosis? You know, I, I think that that's a good question. And I think that that's a complicated question. Um, you know, within my scope, um, I, you know, I, I took it to a place to make sure that that I was addressing the specific questions and that I could follow their lead and um, trying to further explore because I didn't want to put any ideas into their heads. You know, this is a young child, so I don't want to say, you know, like, well, what are you thinking about your own mortality? You know, I, I they didn't really have the capacity to, I think, process on that level. So just kind of um, going as, as deep as I, as I could, that was appropriate. And with what they were giving me, um, I, you know, I can't, I don't ever want to assume, I don't ever want to, you know, I, I guess, I guess assume I just, you know, I really just try to take their lead and just kind of like, okay, you're taking it here. Like, let's validate this thought or if that makes sense, that kind of sounds yeah. like <laughs> No, I think I think that's maybe. Yeah, I think that's important. I think that, like you're saying, it's this idea of following their lead, and um, and maybe it is sort of what they're feeling. It is maybe it is not, but following with this idea of a story of developing the story, um, and maybe that process itself is already doing something for them and we might not have the chance to know what it is, but just the fact that they brought this story into the table and they said, this is uh, what's on my mind and working therapeutically in this context, I think that that probably had uh, um, an interesting, or a, at least gave this child the opportunity to, like you said, to to be heard and, and yeah. seen and, and what they wanted to express. Yeah, and that's what, you know, like within the music, it was a safe space and kind of looping it back to, you know, what the medical team sees, you know, I can I can loop back with them and say, hey, you know, this this child is asking these questions, like, you know, if you're if you're speaking about round if you're speaking in rounds about, you know, these specific topics, like make sure you know that this child is listening. So like giving giving the medical team insight onto, you know, what's kind of going on. Um, psychosocially on all those other levels that they might not be aware and that they can that can help them better communicate with that pa patient and that family yeah you know something uh, is coming to my mind so there is this article um, about it's it's music therapy or the, well it's actually a psychologist in the Philippines and it's an article in the music and medicine journal and it's really interesting because it's three case studies and it's about how uh, uh, the psychologists use songwriting with children and it was very much focused on storytelling and they did express kind of how their they maybe had fears or what was going on in their minds through the stories but I'll be happy to send that along to anybody watching because I it was very um, very moving because she got permission to um, to share the the lyrics while maintaining confidentiality and um, and they were they are very moving so I think at some point I'll probably share those on a blog post through Sam's fans yeah so um, thank you um, I we've had some people say thank you I think uh, Nikki is watching saying what a good story um, and Tammy Shella as well as saying Tammy. part of the therapists awesome well shall we uh, maybe hear an art therapy story i think so <laughs> all right um, so the patient story i'm going to share is about an adolescent patient specifically that i worked with um for about two years until they finished chemotherapy for a brain tumor um Nearing the end of their chemotherapy treatment, their treatment team kind of met with me because they were a little bit more concerned about um, like her mental health and how she's feeling about ending treatment and wanted me to further assess maybe where she was in all of this. And um, 
So I was happy to do it. Like I always appreciate like a consult, especially from a medical team who has so much trust in your services. Um, so I met with the patient and I decided I was going to facilitate a specific art therapy intervention um, that also is like accompanied by a rating scale. So this particular artwork, you use a rating scale to kind of um, rate specific characteristics about the image and while also processing this with the patient, because like Christine said before, we can't just assume that we know by looking at art, what the patient is feeling or thinking. Uh, it always requires us asking about it. So to get their um, insight about it. So I asked her to um, draw an image of a person picking an apple from a tree. And that's all I said. And she was like happy to go with that. Like she didn't need any more encouragement or direction. She was eager to start drawing. And so um, after she drew the image, we processed the image together, like I said, and then we used the elements um, of rating the art afterwards so uh, i wish i had a signed consent to show you what the image actually looked like but i'm going to try to describe it the best i can mm -hmm. so just bear with me <laughs> um so in the image um it shows uh both a man and a woman that the patient identified as male and female um the female looking at the tree trying to pick an apple from it which the patient i kind of identified that these apples were 24 karat gold apples specifically. She said they're real golden apples. So that was significant. Um, and the, there was a ladder behind the female character and she was unaware that the ladder was behind her, the patient said. So um, there was this male figure kind of standing behind the female figure, which the patient said that she was the male figure was wondering how stupid this female figure can be to not realize that this ladder is right behind her to get to the apple. So, um, you know, she kind of processed this as maybe some judgment that she was feeling in high school. Um, you know, she also said that both of these characters had like non-conforming um, clothing styles, which she said she also uh, was relate like relatable to her. So she kind of said that she felt different in school, maybe to compare to some of the other kids um, that she knew. So she kind of identified that like she felt judged at school sometimes being different and just wanting to fit in. So we talked more about these apples and um, she kind of said that um, the relationship between the man and the uh, woman were unknown but um, she titled the image, How? And what that meant was the female character asking, how can I get to these apples? So we kind of determined that like after processing that she seemed helpless in being um, able to like cope or problem solve or meet goals, potentially like, long-term goals because of her socioeconomic status. Um, so it seemed like she was searching for guidance and resources to further develop these like life skills. And she kind of said that, like the resources are there, but she doesn't know how to utilize them or how to really gather them to get to her goal, which was obviously um, she wanted more for herself. So um, it seemed as if like her, you know, she kind of said like her basic needs to, were the biggest priority here, um, which focus more on like short-term needs versus the long-term needs because basic needs are obviously essential to day-to-day -day life. And if we don't have those, it's hard to get through a day versus like thinking about long-term goals. Um, so afterwards I met with her medical team again and I shared this information, which was like very insightful for them. Um, and we came up with additional resources to provide the patient. Um, she saw a psychologist as well. And I knew she had already experienced some depression and anxiety, which we had um, kind of worked through in other expressive art therapy interventions, but this kind of gave us more insight as to what are her needs right now and how can we help her today to get her to where she ultimately wants to be. So this information helped them better understand and identify her goals and needs and, um, since then, you know, she's been off therapy for two years and is thriving in adulthood now. 
Um, it was just amazing and impactful for me to not only utilize what I learned in school as an art therapist, but to like see it in real life and show, have the artwork show so much. Um, it was so telling and having the patient's information to kind of support all of that was very insightful. And um, I think it just shows like the power of art to, you know, get patients to feel comfortable to talk about like what's going on in their lives and how can we help. Yeah, I can tell that this was an impactful story or an impactful experience for her and a story that has remained with you um, during this time. Is, um, you know, I was wondering as you were talking, you know, is the idea of this intervention that metaphor and this uh, artistic elements that go into this prompt reflect personal or can reflect a personal element in the life of the patient? Is that sort of the idea? Yes. So it kind of shows um, where they are like in a clinical state, but also how do they problem solve? Um, so we use like the, it's called the formal elements art therapy scale, also known as the FEATS. And it's a scale that captures information, not only um, like content such as specific color and environmental and clothing details, but it also um, helps us identify like equivalents of what some of the psychiatric symptoms in the DSM are. So it can help us kind of like see inside of, you know, um, how is the patient coping with things? How do they solve issues and problems? Um, are, are they healthy coper? Do they need some assistance in developing some coping mechanisms? So it kind of gives us just a little bit more insight in how we can help them. Um, mm -hmm on the day-to-day. -day. Yeah. Right, and a piece of art like this, it it really, it's a story as well, right? Like when she was describing it and doing it, she was, or this client was thinking about a story behind it, right? It's not just the image and then that's it, right? So right. I think that that's very interesting as well. Yeah. And that's an important part of the intervention is asking what's going on in the picture, you know, asking questions to kind of get the patient's perspective and not just what I see in the image, because what I see can be very different than what she sees. So it's so important to have them kind of tell the story about their artwork. And also, if they title it, what does that title mean to them? Yeah, yeah. I can tell in both these these stories and these examples that you mentioned um, how the creative process and the modalities allow for these stories and these Mm, yeah, for these stories, for the products even that come out of them to be almost a less threatening way of really talking to patients about what is going on in their lives rather than coming and being like, oh, how do you feel today? And tell me all that's wrong in your life right now, that which with children specifically um, could be a bit hard, right? So I, I, I love how both of the stories that you mentioned reflect that, right? How these modalities um, enable these, this collaborative process and this space for, for children to open up and, and share whatever they need and want to share. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, of course. Anybody watching, you know, you, you can always ask questions or write comments as we chat here. Um, I'm not sure, I don't necessarily have questions related to those stories. I think they were great. Uh, if there are any other elements that you want to discuss, of course, that's, that's more than okay. Um, but we could also keep chatting about just the idea of stories. Is there anything else you want to say about what, what you shared? Um, I. I don't think so. Um, it's just kind of what you were saying um, that these children kind of express what, what they want. And, you know, it's there are some really impactful stories and song, songs that we write and stories that we tell. And, and then there's also surface level about silly stuff and that's totally okay. Um, but the, the really, really wonderful thing is, is when you know, our patients can truly express what they want to in a way that's uh, just less threatening and um, almost, 
I don't know if it's easier, but um, just in a very different way than just saying it. Mm -hmm. so, in a safer yeah. way, I would, like a safer space to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's oh, that's almost how children operate, right? That's why we have stories for children. That's how they learn, how they uh, interact through narratives. Um, they're just so important, which is just not not just in a clinical context, right? Just um, um, in 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 school, and as kids are growing up, they grow up listening to stories, and that's that's very impactful. And then bringing this additional element of of art or music, it's uh, it just you know, um, has a double impact almost. Mm -hmm. So great. Um, well, I think maybe we could shift again a little bit, and I would be curious to ask about your stories. I think maybe we talked a, li a little bit about it in our previous um, interview, but I'm just curious about uh, your story as therapist, how you came into this profession, what impacted you, and what, in a sense, what's your narrative um, throughout these years. So. Should we go with the same order, uh, Christine? You wanna? Would you like to go first? It's totally up to you. Oh, after you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so kind of you. Um, to make a long story short, I, you know, originally wanted to go to school for musical theater, and you know, I came upon music therapy. I had heard about it in high school when I did a statistics project on um, music therapy and Alzheimer's patients. Um, my grandpa did have Alzheimer's, so that was a really um, special project for me. And so then when I got to school and I discovered they had music therapy there, I, I jumped right in and never really looked back. And, um, you know, I started working um, with adults and then switched to pediatrics, you know, all, like seven and a half-ish years ago. Um, and this is, pediatrics is truly truly where I belong and, and really thrive. So that's kind of my story. Mm -hmm. um, I also, obviously, I've always loved art my entire life. Um, I felt like throughout my entire life, I've always used art as a way of coping. And I didn't even know art therapy existed when I went to college or I ever knew it was a thing. I'd never been exposed to it. So originally I was going to school for graphic design and I kind of was just like, I don't think I want to be at a computer all day. Like I want to be helping people um, and kind of switched gears at that point. And I just started taking some psychology classes and always accompanied by art classes. I feel like I can never make it through a semester without at least taking one art class. And um, in community college, the one I went to had some art therapy classes and I was like, oh, like, what's this about? So um, I checked it out and th that's when I knew like that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to combine psychology and art. This was like the perfect degree, like the perfect profession that I had just stumbled upon and realized like that was what I wanted to do. So um, like Christine, I started working with adults and then transitioned to children's like maybe two years after that. And um, I honestly like love both populations. Um, it's really great to kind of see kids like where they're starting in the medical environment to kind of set them up for the future. Like if they're gonna have to come back throughout adulthood, it's great to get them started having like a positive experiences as kids so that they're not afraid as adults um, for like when they're seen later on in life. So. It's been kind of great to see like both ends of the lifespan, um, but it's kind of nice to be like such a important factor for, you know, getting them kind of established and feeling comfortable in the medical system. A good point. Mm -hmm. Just giving them more coping skills. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. And I, I like how many of the people I've talked uh, with throughout these series um, they heard about music therapy in high school. Um, and for me, you know, to me, that's very, very cool because not in, um, it, it's still a very nascent professional all over the world. So the fact that kids are um, hearing about it as early as high school, I think it's cool. And, you know, I'm not entirely familiar with the art therapy world and 
um, how all that looks for you, but I'm glad that you were able to find your way into it or that it found you eventually. So Me I think too. that's... <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a bit of a fun question here as we are wrapping up. So okay. I'll be curious if there are any stories that don't necessarily have to relate to music therapy or to your clinical practice and it can be harry potter it can be whatever so just like any stories that uh one story that resonates with you or that has influenced you um, in the past that's a good question I'm trying to think i don't know i mean i think a lot of broadway musicals really really inspire me in a lot of uh, different levels. I still have that part in my heart, but I'm really, um, I'm really inspired by a, a lot of my colleagues, um, um, you know, in music and art therapy, especially like, and also watching some of these powers of story, power of stories um, that you all are doing. Just, I, I love hearing stories about how music and art therapy, how music, how art, um, you know, can change things, can change people, can touch people in ways that, you know, aren't so obvious. Um, I'm also, you know, really inspired by the path that physicians take, and this is not music or art therapy, but you know, what it takes to become a doctor and all these levels of, of helping, helping our patients. And, you know, they have that side of the brain and they have that aspect. And I'm so, I feel so honored to be on the other side to kind of treat the help treat the entire person so that was like a, a lot of things that inspire me but um mm -hmm. oh great yeah you know yeah yeah no that's cool that's cool so you, you don't have a favorite musical oh geez that's a hard question <laughs> from what era do i you know like i i i don't i don't know if i have a favorite that's really hard that's a hard question is that's fair enough that's fair favorite enough. you talk about what impacts you <laughs> um i would say like obviously all the the diversity that comes with art um, and the impact that has on so many different people and different cultures, I think is definitely um, impactful as well as the way it can provide, you know, so much information around like social justice and, um, you know, current events. And I think it just provides a, a creative approach to all of those and an outlet and to express yourself and how you're feeling about current climates and things going on and things that, you know, can be addressed. And as well as, you know, like you said, like our coworkers, like maybe the ones that aren't particularly in our field, but we do a lot of co-treating in the clinic. So I think like seeing like other people, their approaches and how we can adapt, you know, our services to that approach and like do a session, like facilitate a session that like encompasses so much um, in, an hour, you know? So I think like that collaboration piece is also, a, you know, very impactful to kind of help each other out and ultimately help the patient out and be able to expand what we can provide. Um, you know, we have such a wide toolbox, always adding things into it. Um, so I think that can only help. Yeah, absolutely. And at some sense, we of course love supporting what you're doing uh, I'm gonna put here a link on the screen so that people can go and see some of those other interviews and listen to those stories that we've been talking about. So you can go up, uh, it's there, you can see it, but bit.ly slash Sam's Fans Power of Stories and people can watch the videos or um, uh, for our audience out there, you can also consider making a donation so that we can keep supporting the programs at our partner hospitals we have two more interviews well it's today and then one more coming up next week with uh, cincinnati children's hospital medical center and um it's been a pleasure to talk with you christine and jackie i don't know if you have any parting words um anything else you would like to tell our audience um just 
for me, thank you everyone so much who's watching, who's gonna come back and watch later. Um, thank you, Sam's fans and Sam for having us. And thank you, Sam, for not playing an April Fool's prank on us today. <laughs> right, that's true. Oh no, I, I forgot to think about that. <laughs> I thought about wearing a funny mask or something, but I think yeah. this here is enough of a prank where we don't have to prank each other. True. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah. But yeah. Thank you for having us. Um, and thank you for continuing to support us. And, um, you know, we're happy to see you guys like in person, I guess the best we can right now. Yeah. And hope to see you, see you, see you sometime in the future. Soon. Yeah, hopefully. Well, I think this is also a good uh, time to invite our viewers to an event that we are having on April 11th. Um, this one, it will be in person, but it will be safely distanced because it's a scavenger hunt through Columbus. Um, so people will be able to sign up as teams, so either with a family or a group of friends, and then they get a, uh, a set of clues, and then they go to several locations in a small portion of the city to collect um, little goodies like egg shakers and pizza, ice cream, and, and so on. So I'm going to put the, um, the link in the chat. Let me see if I remember. So, yeah, it's called the uh, Sam's Fans Amaz The Amazing Birthday Adventure. So, this, um, so we're celebrating uh, Sam's birthday. So that there's the link. And um, yeah, I hope hope some people who are watching can come by and participate at the end the sam's fans team is gonna be there also with a bit of a birthday surprise so i uh, go check that out as well now can people attend virtually um you know we have not really talked much about it i think we might we might we're gonna be sharing photos and stories and people could always uh, if they were thinking about about Sam's fans and about this event at home, they could snap a picture and use the hashtag, and we would love to also create that community. But that's that's a good point. Thanks for asking. I think we can uh, just invite people also to, in a sense, attend virtually. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Christine and Jackie. It's really it's always a pleasure to chat with you and. Thank you for all the wonderful things you're doing at, at Cleveland Clinic Children's. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Sam's fans, for watching. I'll, we'll see you for the last episode of this series next week, Thursday at noon. All right, till Great. then.